The following true stories have been narrated from the book Nagane, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch, Revised and Expanded Edition, written by Red Grossinger. You can find a link to purchase your copy in the video description. A man contacted me by phone to report that while driving the Kaziar Road, he had to swerve in order to miss a family group of ambulating bipedal entities, which he described as Sasquatch. This sighting took place at about 4 a.m. on Monday, July 3, 2000, close to the junction of B.C. Highways No. 37 and 37A, which lead to the community of Stewart, B.C. The witness was driving at about 55 miles per hour when he entered a right-hand curve in the road. Even though it was almost daylight, the sky was still grayish at this time, but the visibility was good on the road. As he was about halfway through the curve, he noticed two very large bipedal, ambulating entities in the middle of the road, right in front of him, and no more than ten feet away. He immediately moved on to the left-hand lane of the road so as to not hit them and applied the brakes. This was when he realized that he was looking at two mature Sasquatch, a male on the right-hand side of a female Sasquatch, with his left arm on the shoulder of the female. He noticed the female holding something in her arms, which he did not clearly see. However, a bit later on, when he reviewed the encounter in his mind, he took this something as being a newborn baby, an infant. During this time, the creatures continued walking slowly across the road and reached the forest into which they disappeared. The most important factor of this sighting, which he repeated a number of times, is the look given to him by the female Sasquatch and the impression it left on the witness. She looked directly and intensely into the witness's eyes, and her eyes seemed to pass or convey a message, which he clearly understood the meaning to be, Do not hurt me. The man in question then stated that by that time he was totally in shock, and he pulled over onto the side of the road a few meters ahead, just past the curve. Although he had a camera on the passenger seat, he did not make an attempt to take a photograph. Actually, the witness mentioned that the idea never occurred to him. It never even crossed his mind until much later. The witness cannot recall exactly how tall the two Sasquatch were. He could only say that they were tall, huge, stocky, and big, which may be the result of him being in shock. He remembered them to be grayish-brown, which may be due to the time of the morning and the lack of good light. It should be remembered that most Sasquatches have been reported to be in some shade of brown, usually dark brown. This was the first time he had ever seen a Sasquatch, but he had read about them and came forward only after reading an article about me in a local newspaper. He is absolutely certain they were a couple of Sasquatch. During the three interviews that I conducted with him, he mentioned a number of times the look given to him by the female, and he stated that in his mind it was as if she was talking to him, saying, Do not hurt me. A husband and wife, both from the Teslin Tlingit Council, reported having observed a large ambulating bipedal creature crossing the Alaska Highway, Yukon Highway No. 1, just across from the airport at the western edge of the community of, of Teslin, at about 1.30 a.m. on Thursday, June 10, 2004. It was reported that the creature observed was slightly hunched over with dark hair and identified by the man as a Sasquatch. The community of Teslin is located 114 miles east of Whitehorse on the Alaska Highway. The witnesses are two respected members of the Teslin Tlingit Council, whose names have been widely publicized through the CBC North Radio and the local Whitehorse newspapers. At the time, they were riding an ATV on their way home, located west of town, traveling in a westerly direction in the right-hand ditch between the Alaska Highway and the airport, when they noticed what they originally thought was a person standing beside the highway, on the lake side of the road, their left-hand side. It was about 1.30 a.m. They thought this person might need a lift to town. They certainly were convinced of what they observed standing beside the road, and then observed it crossing the road in a bipedal fashion directly in front of them. They were both experienced hunters and bushwise, as the great majority of the Yukon First Nations people are, and there's no way in the world they would have mistaken a Sasquatch for anything else. The witnesses reported that they had first stopped their ATV, then turned around and approached the creature to within about 20 feet, when the Sasquatch crossed the Alaska Highway in three steps directly in front of them. I took the time to do the following measurements. Each lane is 12 feet wide for a total of 24 feet, 
plus a curb of four feet on each side of the road for a total road width from ditch to ditch of 32 feet. The ditch on the lake side is about five feet deep, while the one on the airport side is about three feet deep. If the Sasquatch was standing on the edge of the paved portion on the lake side, it would have to cover a distance of some 28 feet and three steps to get into the ditch where the witnesses were originally traveling, or 9.3 feet per step. By stating the Sasquatch crossed the road in three steps, they may have also meant that it crossed the portion of the road between the two white lines, which would only be 24 feet. In any case, the number of steps taken is obviously wrong, but then again, who's counting when one comes face to face with one of these forest giants? I, for one, would be too excited to accurately count the steps taken and could easily mistake five steps for three steps. Or maybe they considered and called a stride a step, although we all know by now that a stride is two steps. A First Nations friend told me that a male driver had come face to face with a bipedal creature, which he identified as a Sasquatch in the early morning hours of Friday, September 29, 2004. The man was on his way outside, meaning out of the Yukon for us Yukoners, after having worked in Dawson City during the summer, when he decided to take the Robert Campbell Highway as a shortcut to Watson Lake and further southern destinations. After about two hours of driving, he decided to take a rest at about midnight after previously turning onto the Robert Campbell Highway at about 10 p.m. at CarMax. The driver had stopped at a pull-off for a short sleep. After a few hours, he woke up and was ready to carry on, but first went out of the vehicle to answer the call of nature. As he approached a small clearing in the forest, he noticed a strange smell, similar to a dead animal. He then ventured into the bush for about 16 feet in the general direction of the smell to explore the cause of this strange smell. This is when he noticed what he first thought to be a bear bending over and appearing to be eating an animal carcass. The bipedal meat eater then stood up, most likely realizing it had company, and began walking on two legs in the direction of the driver with its arms swinging. This is when the driver realized that he was actually facing a Sasquatch and not a bear. The driver then quickly ran back to his car and took off in a hurry. On Friday, January 6, 2006, at 9.30 p.m., a woman was driving back to Whitehorse when she observed the creature described as a tall Sasquatch with dark hair and a sort of bluish hue reflection standing beside a power line pole on her left-hand side of the road on the South Klondike Highway on her way home to Whitehorse. She was in her late 30s at the time of the sighting. She mentioned that it had been snowing lightly at the time of the sighting. She had the wipers on, but her view was unobstructed, and she clearly saw a tall and large entity standing on two feet on the left-hand side of the road by the power pole, identified as a Sasquatch. She stated that its left shoulder was against the pole, and it was looking in her direction of her vehicle, although she could not remember the fine details of the face. However, she figured it had to be at least seven feet tall. The sighting was about 10 seconds long, and I would venture to advance that the reported bluish hue observed was probably due to the headlights shining against the hairs reflecting a light covering of snow upon it. While further communicating with the witness, she mentioned that her uncle lives directly across the road on the east side where the sighting occurred. Interestingly, when she reached home, she phoned him to mention the sighting. Her uncle told her that at about 10 p.m. that evening, the dogs went crazy in their kennels, and he said to her that it lasted a while, and they were still barking when she called. She is definite about the sighting and has no doubt in her mind whatsoever as to the creature being a Sasquatch. A man who was a truck driver by trade contacted me by email to report that he had experienced a vocal occurrence after stopping at a roadside rest area at around 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, March 23, 2006. The truck driver had stopped at the rest stop to have his dinner, and while his meal was heating up alongside the truck's engine, he decided to walk about, stretching his legs. As he started walking, he immediately had a feeling of being watched for some reason, a very strong feeling of not being wanted, to such a point that he experienced a hirsute effect, where hairs on the back of his neck stood erect. He then returned to his truck and climbed aboard, as his door window was open and the truck engine had been shut off, he could hear some sort of howling from a distance but he couldn't quite make out what it was. He started to eat his dinner when, a few minutes later, he heard that howl again, but now closer and much louder, which made him quite nervous, not knowing what the source of the howling was. 
Then, a stronger feeling of not being wanted came upon him. At this point, he decided to throw his dinner into a nearby garbage can and leave the area. To do so, he had to step out of his truck and walk to the garbage can some 16 feet away. After disposing of his dinner, he was making his way back to the truck. He heard another, louder howl, this time very close. By now, it had been about 10 minutes since he heard the first vocal, which each time appeared to be longer and louder, obviously showing that the maker of the vocals was on the move and getting closer to his location. This is when he started his truck and departed the rest area. The truck driver further attests that he had been driving for many years and had never experienced anything close to that occurrence before. Upon returning home, he decided to check out what could be the source of all this howling, and he discovered that similar vocals had previously been reported at other locations in the U.S. This is when he contacted me, and we communicated on a regular basis so I could gather the needed information. There was no mention of other types of vocals, except howls accompanied by hair-raising and a sense of uneasiness, a feeling of not being wanted at a certain place, a deep feeling that one must go away. These feelings have been reported many times before, and I can vouch about such weird feelings, as I have experienced the very same on a few occasions. This setting occurred on a short trail off the Duncan Creek Road, not far from Mayo Lake, located at a distance of some 12 miles south of Keno City, at around 8 p.m. on Tuesday, July 8, 2008. The witness was a male in his mid-60s at the time of the sighting. He was a self-employed hearing specialist conducting hearing tests at various mine sites around the Yukon. The witness was on his way to mine sites in the area of Keno City. As he was slightly ahead of schedule, he decided to stop on the Duncan Creek Road and set up camp for the night at a gravel pit before getting to the first mine site for his scheduled 10 a.m. appointment the next day. The man in question reports that he had set up his three-ton truck fitted with his hearing testing equipment, a bedroom and a kitchen dining room in a small clearing that had previously been a small gravel pit, ready to camp for the night. He had eaten dinner and at about 7 p.m. decided to take a short walk along a small trail, which he later found out would lead to Duncan Creek. He reached the creek around 7.10 or so, and spent some time looking around for interesting rocks and that sort of thing. Around 7.30, or shortly thereafter, he decided to return to his truck. As he mentioned that he was making his way back to his truck, he was going up a small incline over mostly hard gravel soil with the odd sandy spot. The bush was quite dense, although the trees were not so large around the immediate area, mostly black spruce, white pines, willows, and occasionally birch trees. He then came to a slight right-hand bend in the trail, and as he proceeded, he suddenly came face to face with the two Sasquatch, at a distance of 10 feet or so, directly in front of him, walking on the same trail in his direction. He was surprised, to say the least. He then noticed the female Sasquatch, which was originally walking beside and mostly in front of the male. But during the encounter, she immediately went behind the male, for protection it would appear, as soon as she noticed the man in question. Then, this is when the witness noticed that she was pregnant and was what he described as ready to pop, meaning that she was just about ready to give birth. Both male and female Sasquatch stopped walking at that moment as well. At first, the male showed teeth in a grimace of sorts, as the witness reported, but made no sounds or vocals at all. The witness then stated that they all stood still for a moment, which seemed to him like minutes. A few seconds later, while still facing the Sasquatch, the witness made hand gestures by first bringing his open right hand to his heart and presenting his open hand forward to the Sasquatch, palm up in a sign of friendship. He did the same gesture about three or four times, as he recalled, and the male Sasquatch then became less agitated and no longer grimaced. Then, the witness reports, he pointed to the sky with his right hand as it was starting to cloud over and would probably rain in a few minutes, trying to send a message that it was going to rain soon. He then made another gesture with his hand, showing that he would get out of their way by walking around them into the bush to their right-hand side to let them have the trail. He communicated this by gesturing with his left hand and placing his right hand upon the left-hand side of his chest. Then the witness slowly started walking to his left in an attempt to enter the bush. All of a sudden, both Sasquatch swiftly moved in the direction of the bush to their left and suddenly disappeared from view, without a single sound. He mentioned that specific point because he could no longer see them nor hear them walking in the bush. 
they made no noise whatsoever. Nothing like the sound of a human being or a large animal would make while walking on soil covered with brush debris, broken branches, and dead leaves in a dense bush. The witness stated at the time that he thought the Sasquatch just sort of disappeared into thin air rather than walked away in a normal fashion with the normal forest walking sounds. The man further mentioned that it took him a while to really and fully understand what had happened and realized that indeed he had come face to face with two Sasquatch. He was obviously in shock for a while and had to first acknowledge the importance of the encounter in order to think clearly. The witness mentioned that the male Sasquatch would have been about seven feet tall, big, very large, with a sturdy and very muscular physique. The male Sasquatch had long legs and very long, visibly muscular arms hanging from huge shoulders with the fingers sort of curled in and facing to the rear. The hands were hanging just below their knees. Both Sasquatch were covered with long and dark shaded hair. The witness did not venture any guess as to their possible weight as he said that, I could not state a person's weight to save my own life. As well, the witness could not provide specific details of the skin around the face other than it was dark. The eyes were rather small and the shape of the nose like that of a boxer. He could not provide details as to the shape of the forehead nor the shape of the head, as the witness stated that he didn't even think about those features and details, probably due to his state of nervousness and possible shock. He did notice the mouth of the male Sasquatch, however, as the male made a sort of grimace while showing his teeth in a sort of facial distortion. The witness mentioned the lips being sort of grayish-brown with dirty off-white grayish teeth, which were very human-looking. The mouth was elongated and large, with what appeared to be prominent lips and a prominent chin, but the chin was not overly protruding in any way. There were no specific details concerning the female Sasquatch, except that she was pregnant and moved behind the male as a movement of self-protection. A few points are quite interesting in this encounter, such as the communication by the use of gestures and hand signals, for example. It would appear that both Sasquatch understood the meaning of the hand gestures, as expressed by the responses to the gestures and the resulting calmness. It would also appear that they understood that the witness wished to move into the bush of his own accord to give them the right of way, and they obviously meant to do no harm to the witness, as they actually gave him the trail. The movement of the female Sasquatch is indicative of a human familiarity trait, as she was counting on the male Sasquatch for protection by moving behind him away from the man on the same trail, directly in front of them. Two men from Alaska, on their way to catch a ferry at Haines, Alaska, reported to have observed two very tall human-like creatures somewhere close to the summit of Chilkat Pass in 2008. The men reported that they had driven from Talk, Alaska, through Beaver Creek, Yukon, arriving in Haines Junction late in the evening of Wednesday, October 29, 2008, around 11.30 p.m., they decided to carry on driving to Haines, Alaska, in the dark and during a snowstorm. Not a wise decision, I might add. At around 2 a.m., the snowstorm they had been fighting became more intense, and the visibility was so bad they had to slow down to a speed of about 15 miles per hour. At about that time, their car went off the road, slowly slipping into the right-hand ditch. Throughout the night, they had made several attempts to get the car back on the road, but without success. During one of those attempts, one of the men noticed a dark figure standing and watching them from the top of a cliff which was reported to be about 23 feet high and just about 20 yards away in an eastern direction. The witness states that they had no idea how long this creature had been watching them. It just stood there, not moving, nor making any noise, just watching. One of the men decided to grab a machete from the trunk of the car and start waving it around in an attempt to scare away the creature. That seemed to work as the creature in question walked away after a few minutes. However, about five minutes later, another creature appeared. This one was much taller than the first and judged to be about nine feet tall and heavily built, according to the witness, with shoulders over 39 inches wide, with very dark, long hair, probably about 10 inches long, blowing in the wind. At this point, the smaller creature came back into view as well. The tall creature stood there watching them, bobbing up and down, then going into what would be a crouched-over position, just like a football linebacker, with his hand below his knees but not touching the snow. The man who had scared off the first creature mentioned that he should do the same thing again, but his partner persuaded him not to do it, 
and they both got into the car, locking the doors. Some ten minutes or so later, both creatures departed, and once again, they were alone in the ditch and in the dark. About an hour later, having decided to try getting the car back on the road, they exited their car and started to shovel again, when a set of lights came up from behind them. That vehicle slowed down, just like they had done. That vehicle, a small red truck, slipped into the ditch as well, just behind them. This is when they noticed an older lady with white hair. As they all worked, trying to get the lady's truck back on the road first, another set of lights became visible, and luckily, it was a Yukon Department of Highways snowplow this time. As is custom in these parts, the truck pulled both vehicles out of the ditch. The driver of the plow truck must have known the lady, as he called her by name and mentioned that she should have known better than to drive in these conditions. The two witnesses were totally convinced that they had seen two Sasquatch at the Chilcat Pass Summit, a.k.a. the Haines Summit, certainly not bears out from hibernation or anything else, and both Sasquatch were in view for a good ten minutes. The tallest Sasquatch reportedly was about nine feet tall. Later, in Haines, Alaska, where they had stopped to get something to eat before catching the ferry, they overheard a conversation amongst local residents who were talking about Sasquatch. One said that he had noticed Sasquatch in the vicinity of the summit recently. In mid-July of 2010, a witness and another member of the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, both in their 20s then, were returning home to Whitehorse from Fish Lake, where they had been fishing for a good part of the day. At around 6 p.m. that day, they were approaching Fish Creek, just before the turn at the Yukon Electric Flow Control System, when they observed a large bipedal entity crossing the road just a few meters ahead of them. They identified this creature as a Sasquatch. It crossed Fish Lake Road from the right-hand side to the left. The witness stated that the Sasquatch had climbed to the road from the right ditch, which I later measured to be six and a half feet high and fairly steep. The Sasquatch crossed the road in four steps. I measured the road width to be 18 feet at that point, which means that each step would have been about four and a half feet in length. The man judged the Sasquatch to be at least seven feet tall with long dark brown hair and very muscular. During the early evening of Wednesday, July 20th, 2015, four ladies were returning home to Haines Junction after spending some time in Whitehorse. As the car approached Marshall Creek, one of them noted that she saw what she thought was a man in dark coveralls picking berries beside the road. She mentioned this to the others, and one of them wondered aloud, why is there no vehicle parked by the bridge? Very odd, they thought. As the car slowed down before crossing the Marshall Creek Bridge, one of the ladies said, that's not a man, that's a Sasquatch. The car driver slowed down and stopped just past the bridge, a couple of meters beside the entity. All of them had a good look at the creature, who at the time was hunched over picking some berries only about six feet from the road where the car had stopped. A few seconds later, when the creature became aware of the car, it stood up, looked at the car, appearing to be rather curious, intrigued, and not frightened in any way. It did not attempt to move away, according to one of the ladies. Two other cars went by while their car was stopped. None of those cars' occupants appeared to be paying attention to what was going on. After two or three minutes, the Sasquatch departed, slowly walking into the bush, and the ladies carried on to their homes in Haines Junction. One of them contacted a related man. This man, who I have known for years and who is aware of my research work on the matter of Sasquatch, sent me an email in the morning of Thursday, July 21, 2015, mentioning the sighting and provided me with all the details he had. I contacted a friend of mine who's a member of another First Nation, and she contacted one of the witnesses, as she knew that person quite well. She conducted a short interview concerning the sighting on my behalf. The friend passed on the information to me afterward. I visited the location of the sighting on Friday, July 22, 2015, and all I could see were hundreds of foot impressions around trampled plants, tall grass, and a few berry bushes. Apparently, many people from Haines Junction and Champaign have visited the site to pick berries and walked all over any possible useful information. The only information from the interview that was useful is that the bipedal entity, identified as a Sasquatch by the occupants of the car, was about seven feet tall with very dark, long hair, standing erect on two feet with no apparent breasts. The upper body was muscular but not fat and did not appear to be afraid of the car or its occupants. 
While discussing Sasquatch with a man, he said that in late June of 1998, a First Nation woman told him that she had once observed a Sasquatch. She had gotten out of bed at around 3 a.m. to get a drink of water. As she was pouring water in her glass, standing by her kitchen window, she happened to look outside and observed a tall, large Sasquatch picking carrots from her garden. He ate a couple and carried a few more with him while crossing the street in the direction of the Stewart River. She obviously had a good look at the creature. At 3 o'clock in the morning in that part of the Yukon is almost like noon in the southern parts of Canada. This witness, while working at the Swift River Lodge, at the time was riding an ATV on the Silver Heart Project access road on his day off. The encounter occurred in the late afternoon of Thursday, September 7, 1995. He remembers the date quite well, as it was his 25th birthday and he was spending a bit of time exploring on his day off, as he had done many times before. When he reached mile 24 or so of the Silver Heart Road, he heard a loud snap like the sound of a large branch being broken in the nearby bush on the left-hand side of the road. Focusing on the area where he had heard the sound, he then observed a large creature, judging it to have been about 7 feet tall, sort of trying to hide behind a couple of large trees about 30 yards away. The creature in question just stood still at the time, not moving at all. He guessed the creature he was observing at the time of the sighting to have been somewhere around 600 pounds, in his opinion, with dark, unkempt, shaggy hair. They stood sort of looking at each other for a few seconds, and the witness then reports, I got scared big time and peeled out, returning to the Swift River Lodge. He mentioned that he was not armed at the time. It was only later on, a few days later actually, that it dawned on him that he had seen a Sasquatch. But he never told anyone about his experience, frightened of being ridiculed, until he contacted me in October 2020. During a late summer evening in June of 1974, the witness, a young lad of 17 years of age at the time, along with his 15-year-old younger brother, decided to catch a few trout and drove to a small man-made reservoir located a few kilometers west of Whitehorse, known locally as the Pump House Lake or Pump House Pond. They were subjected to rocks being thrown at them, and a few minutes later observed a tall entity, which the witness called a Sasquatch, cross the road in front of them. The witness and his brother had arrived at the lake about 7.30 p.m., parked their car at the gate by the pump house, and walked some thousand feet to their usual fishing spot on the eastern side of the lake, where their small homemade wooden raft was tied to a close-by tree. They jumped onto it and started fishing. They had fished for a while, catching a few trout, and at about 9 p.m. decided it was time to get back home. They paddled their small raft back to the mooring, secured it, and started to climb the steep shore to the trail, a distance of about 33 feet, straight up. As they were starting to climb the bank in the direction of the trail, they heard the sound of a large rock falling into the lake, 10 feet behind them. This rock would have been thrown above their heads. Just a few seconds later, another large rock came splashing down at the same location. Thinking it was someone playing a joke on them, the witness yelled out, There are people fishing down at the lake. Stop fooling around. The witness stated that he was getting angry, so he ran up the bank to see who was throwing the rocks. But there was no one there. What he did notice, though, was a very strong and pungent smell in the air, which he described as being akin to the smell of a wet grizzly bear. This got him really worried, so he called out to his brother to hurry up. They walked briskly back to the car, constantly looking around to see whatever may be close to them. On a few occasions, they heard some shuffling sounds in the bush off to the right-hand side, and observed swift movements, but saw nothing definitive. They arrived at their car a few minutes later, placed their fishing gear into it, and started on their journey back to town. As it was now getting a bit darker, the driver turned on the headlights. They had proceeded just a few meters when something bolted out of the bush from the right-hand side and ran across the road about six feet ahead of them. The entity they then observed was really tall, as the witness mentioned, about eight feet tall, and possibly even up to nine feet, and it was covered in darkish brown and black hair. As it crossed the road, it turned its head in the direction of the car for a second, and the witness stated that its eyes were reflecting in the car's headlight. The bipedal entity crossed the 19-foot, 6-inch wide road, which I measured in three long steps that took no more than three seconds and disappeared in the dense forest on the west side of the road. 
Upon returning home, the witness and his brother mentioned what they had experienced to their parents. However, the reaction of their parents was simply that the young guys should stop fooling around and making up stories. They never since discussed their sighting with anyone. The following are excerpts from Red Grosinger's first book, Nagane, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch. Report number one, Anvil Region, sighting by Pharaoh in 1970. This following report number one was provided to me by a Ross River First Nations woman when I was interviewing her about other Sasquatch activities she had observed, namely the 2010 encounter described in report number 41. It so happened that she had mentioned this 2010 encounter to her father, at which time he told her about this pharaoh sighting. She in turn passed the story to me. The councilwoman's father was working at the pharaoh mine at the time, and his workmate explained to him how he had watched the Sasquatch in question. He had observed a tall bipedal creature walking around the town in the winter of 1970, appearing to be checking garbage cans and walking with a significant limp. Encounter The ambulating creature in question, described as a Sasquatch by the witness, a male in his mid-thirties at the time, was going from garbage can to garbage can, apparently searching for food. Of course, garbage cans are a great source of food, and once a Sasquatch realizes such, they will return to find more food, just as bears would do on a regular basis. Local History For many years in the 1950s and 1960s, the area north of Pelly River and west of the community of Ross River had been the subject of intense prospecting by a man by the name of Al Kulin. In the mid-1960s, he discovered the largest vein of lead and zinc ever found, and shortly thereafter, the Cypress Anvil Mining Corporation constructed what was to become the largest lead and zinc mine in the world, with silver and gold being side products. To house the many employees, up to 2100 in January 1982, a town site was constructed in the spring of 1969, which formed the community of Faro, located on the Robert Campbell Highway, Yukon Highway No. 4, some 161 kilometers east of the community of Carmax. But as luck would have it, a good portion of the newly built town was razed to the ground as a result of a nearby wildfire in the summer of 1969. However, such an important mining operation had to move on. The burned portion was immediately rebuilt. The mine remained in operation with trucks of the White Pass and Yukon route, transporting the ore concentrates in large buckets from Faro to Whitehorse, 24 hours a day. These same buckets would then be loaded on the trains of WP and YR and transported to the town of Skagway, some 171 kilometers away in Alaska, where the content would be loaded on board ships to further destinations. In 1982, the mine experienced an ugly and fierce strike. While this was going on, the price of metals fell drastically, and the combination of both forced the mine to shut down. After Kurov Resources suffered a major disaster in Nova Scotia in 1993, they had been forced to shut down the ferro mine operation due to financial difficulties. In 1995, the Anvil Range Mining Corp. acquired the mine site and operated it until 1998. Today, in 2022, the Canadian government is still conducting a cleanup operation with the objective of returning the ground in the area of the mine pit to a condition that would protect the surrounding land and water. The property was left in very bad condition after the forced closure and the bankruptcy of Kura Resources and Anvil Range Mining. Most creeks in the area were devoid of fish and the surrounding land was poisoned by lead and other mining byproducts. The Faro mine has not reopened since, resulting in the population dwindling to a handful of people. Subsequently, however, it has become a retirement community and has a population of 449 residents as of September 2020. The railway is still operating, but only as a tourist train offering scenic rides through the White Pass between Skagway, Alaska and Car Cross, Yukon during the summer months. As for Al Kulin, who had originally discovered the largest ever deposit of lead, zinc, silver and gold in the world, he had semi-retired, spending his winters in Vernon, British Columbia and returning to the Yukon in the summers to do what he liked best, to prospect for minerals. 
In the summer of 1977, he was back in the community of Ross River when he was unfortunately murdered in the local saloon. Investigation There's not much more in this sighting report to investigate or analyze. However, it was mentioned in the report that the bipedal ambulating entity in question was limping badly from what appeared to be their right leg. That would limit their hunting abilities, and they would therefore have to take a chance in going into the communities for an easy source of food. The woman's father mentioned another 1970 Sasquatch sighting from the community of Ross River, some 69 kilometers further east. As she described it, her father spoke of a bipedal ambulating entity described as a Sasquatch with a noticeable limp checking out garbage cans for food. This comprises the next report, report number two, from the community of Ross River, some 69 kilometers east of Faro, dated 1970 as well, which mentions a bipedal ambulating entity described as a Sasquatch with noticeable limping, checking out garbage cans for food. Could these two sightings be from the same wild man? Very possibly. Report number two, Anvil Region, sighting by the Ross River Airport in 1970. While conducting the interview with Ross River Denna Councilwoman, report number one, she mentioned another sighting to me. Encounter. Her father, who resided in Ross River at the time, told her about how he observed an injured, limping, big, bipedal entity walking at the edge of town and who crossed an open field adjacent to the airport. Her father said he then observed that the Sasquatch, as he described the entity, wandered around the community checking the garbage containers. The small village of Ross River is the home of the Ross River Denna Council, with some 412 residents as of September 2020, most of whom are of First Nation ancestry. The community is located some 230 kilometers east of the community of Carmax and 69 kilometers east of the community of Faro on the Robert Campbell Highway, Yukon Highway No. 4. This report mentions that the creature was observed a short time after the similarly injured bipedal entity, described in report number one, was observed in the town of Faro. Local history. This location at the confluence of the Ross River and the Pelly River had been a fall gathering place for indigenous people for as long as they can remember. They would fish the rivers and trade with each other before departing to their individual wintering spots not too far away. In 1901, a white man by the name of Tom Smith started a trading post on the north side of the Pelly River for the purpose of purchasing fur from the First Nations gathered here. He called the trading post Smith's Landing. During that winter, some 15 indigenous families decided to stay for the winter rather than moving on to their usual winter location. During the following two years, more and more family members traveled from the Casca regions of both the Yukon and the Northwest Territories along the Mackenzie River to sell their furs. However, as competition would have it, in 1903, another man built a second trading post on the south side of the Pelly River to take advantage of the larger fur business. By 1914, over a thousand people from indigenous nations would gather here in late summer and fall. A large number would remain for the winter, resulting in Smith's Landing becoming a small community of its own. The name of the community was changed to Ross River in 1914, when the firm Taylor & Drury purchased the trading post. By this time, other trading posts have been built at such locations as Pelly Banks, Sheldon Lake, Francis Lake, and along the McMillan River. In 1916, a severe influenza epidemic hit the community, and many lost their lives. In the following years, the price of fur went down, and by the time the Canole Road was constructed in 1942 to 1943, most other trading posts had closed down, leaving Ross River the only one in operation. With the arrival of the U.S. Army construction crew to construct the Canole Pipeline along the Canole Road, south and north, the community became quite active for a time, with hundreds of U.S. soldiers camped around the community. Geography the community of Ross River is in a large floodplain valley at the confluence of the Ross River, flowing from the north and the Pelly River, flowing from the east. One would notice the high clay bluffs immediately past the floodplain, making room for a series of mountains further north where these fossilized footprints were discovered. Investigation 
The important aspect of these two reports is that the reported Sasquatch showed significant limping while walking, and the timing of both encounters the same day at two locations just a few hours apart. Similarly, in August of 2014, two reports mentioned an encounter and an occurrence a short distance away from each other, reports number 55 and 56. The entity described as a Sasquatch was reported to have a height of between about 6 feet and 7 feet. According to my quick calculation method presented later in this book, a creature of 6 feet would leave footprints just a bit less than 12 inches, which would indicate a young creature. Such Sasquatch would weigh about 504 pounds in the medium category and about 630 and a half pounds, if of the heavier set, and have a step of 46 inches. The average daily calorie requirement would be about 5,230 calories per day to remain healthy. A creature standing at a height of 6.5 feet, medium size, would weigh about 546 pounds and up to 683.5 pounds. For the larger heavy type with a footprint of about 13 inches, such Sasquatch would have a step of about 50 inches. Such a creature would require some 5,660 calories per day to remain in good health. On the other hand, a Sasquatch that is 7 feet would weigh about 588 pounds if of medium build and up to 736 pounds for the larger, more muscular Sasquatch. A creature of that height would leave a footprint measuring about 14 inches and would have a step of about 54 inches. Such a creature would need about 6,010 calories per day to remain healthy. Judging height has always been a problem for most witnesses, especially at a distance of more than 330 feet. These are a few Sasquatch-related activities reported close by. A sighting by Dragon Lake in 1975. A sighting by the Lappy River Pullout in 2004, report number 33. The Faro sighting in 1970, report number 1 and vocals along Swim Lake Road in 2010, report number 45. Note, during the summer of 1985, a number of fossilized footprints were found encrusted in rocks about 30 kilometers north of the community of Ross River and a short distance from the North Canole Road on the northwest side. Those footprints were identified to be from the Parasaurolophus walkeri, which was a crested hadrosaur that lived during the late Cretaceous period some 76.5 to 73 million years ago. According to information about such animals, this hadrosaur would have been some 33 feet long, would usually be biped as well as a quadruped at times, and had a vegetarian diet. These animals originated from Asia and would have come across to North America at some period of time when the two continents were somehow connected during the period of 76 to 73 million years ago. No skeletons of the Parasaurolophilus walkeri were ever found in the Yukon to date. However, quite a few skeletons were located amongst the badlands of Alberta, in Utah, and in New Mexico. The Anvil region was covered by ice from about 4.7 million years ago until about 10,000 years ago. Report number 41, Anvil region. Vocals by the Magundi River in 2010. A woman from the Ross River Dena Council contacted me to report that she and her husband had recently been subjected to extremely loud, uneasy shrieks, scary yells, and debris thrown at them for a good 10 minutes while they were out checking their trap line on the north shore of the Magundi River, deep in a restricted access canyon with high rocky walls on both sides of the river in mid-February 2010. This spot is located about 10 miles directly south of the community of Faro across the Pelly River and across the Robert Canyon Highway, Yukon Highway No. 4. The Magundi River flows in a westerly direction from its source east of Fox Mountain to empty into the Little Salmon Lake. This First Nations couple, in their late 20s at the time, are members of the Ross River Denner Council and have lived in the area of Ross River all their lives. They took up residence in the community of Faro shortly after they were married and both were employed by a local air transport company in the summer. In the winter, they would make a living from trapping animals for their pelts. Geography. This particular area of their trap line is extremely rugged and restricted, located in a deep rocky canyon with tall rock walls some 35 to 50 feet high on both sides of the trail, with a width of about 33 feet between the walls at the bottom. 
These walls, forming a canyon, would go on for a hundred feet or so from where they experienced the vocals, before opening again and getting wider. This area can only be accessed in the winter with snow machines, once the ground is properly covered with deep snow, or in the summer by helicopter. The vegetation consists mostly of thick black spruce, some of them broken off, and short willow brushes covering a mostly frozen swampy ground, although with a few open areas where the water flows faster, and which was not totally frozen at the time. There are plenty of small animals in the immediate area, such as foxes, hares, lynx, porcupines, wolverines, and others, which were the animals the couple were setting the traps for. There are moose as well. On the higher grounds, one finds deer, elk, woodland caribou, along with bears and cougars. Bears would have been hibernating in dens at this time of the year. Wild plants are plentiful as well, especially in the low grounds. Investigation I was contacted by the woman in question by email in May of 2010. She invited me to meet them in Faro whenever I get there, which I managed to do in July of 2010, and conducted an interview with the woman, as her husband was away at a mining exploration camp. She was very open during the interview and provided me with whatever details she could remember. There were actually two different vocal occurrences that she reported to me from two different locations around Faro. One of these experiences occurred along the Magandi River, this one and the other one on a trail leading to Swim Lake, which is part of the next report. Because of the forwardness and the honesty shown by this First Nations woman, along with the minute details she provided me, I consider the witness to be very credible. Occurrence. Here are the details of what took place. They had taken off from their Faro home early that cold February morning while it was still dark outside, each driving their own snow machine and each pulling a sleigh, because they were off to check their trap lines across the Pelly River around the Magundi River Valley, as they had done many times before in 2010 and in previous years. They had arrived at the canyon from the east side and had to get through it in order to check their traps located on the other side of this canyon. The plan was to continue in a westerly direction and finally return home in the late afternoon. They would be covering about 60 miles that day and hopefully fill their sleighs with all the animal pelts they could get. As they entered the canyon at about noon, they were immediately greeted by extremely loud and scary yells, with shrieking guttural sounds coming from both sides and above the walls of the canyon, from two specific and different locations at the same time, which simply scared the hell out of us, as she told me. They had stopped by now, really confused and seriously scared. They could not see what was making all the racket, so they made the decision to turn around and get out of the canyon as continuing seemed futile and possibly dangerous. Because of the type of terrain they were in, and the limited room provided to maneuver their snow machines, it took them a while to turn around, close to ten minutes, I was told. The entire time, they were subjected to yells, screams, shrieks, and then a few small logs and debris thrown over the canyon's walls by two or three entities fairly close to them up on the canyon. They finally managed to turn around and got out of the area as fast as they could, only stopping a couple of times to empty more traps before making it back home by late evening. The following day they discussed what had happened to them with relatives, who were convinced they had come upon a family group of Sasquatch out hunting or possibly residing somewhere close to where this occurrence had taken place. It was mentioned by the couple's relatives, all of them members of the Ross River Denna Council, that the Sasquatch were probably checking the couple's very own traps that they had set back in November and December of 2009, for the animals caught in them would have been an easy source of food and relatively plentiful. This was not necessarily shocking news to the couple, as upon returning to the safety of their house, they had figured out that the wild men of the forest were obviously the source of all the yelling and shrieking. However, hearing from family members did confirm what had evolved in their own minds. The couple have not returned to this canyon on the Magundi River since, abandoning their few traps they had on the west side of the canyon. The witness told me that they actually removed those on the east side during another trip a week or so later. They have since moved a good portion of their trap line to a more friendly location further north and east a bit, closer to the Robert Campbell Highway, as well as to their home in the community of Faro. To purchase a copy of Nagane, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch, 
please contact Red Grossinger at sasquatchyukon at hotmail.com. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.